Welcome to the Not Quite Daily Show, Summer 2017, Episode 11, and today we continue with Maiden Abyss, Episode 11. So I feel like our series is getting progressively darker. I was expecting we'd learn more about Hollows, but I completely did not expect Meaty. Not just the result, uh, but the fact of Nanachi having someone she was a caretaker for. And then to learn that killing Hollows and keeping it hushed is the normal procedure, well, our tone has not gotten brighter. We also seem to be in an interlude again, much like we were during the Seeker Camp episodes. We had made rapid progress since then, but now we've been on the fourth layer for two episodes with no end in sight. And rather than beginning to wrap up some of our known mysteries, we have added to them. So I'm left thinking to myself, the story doesn't finish, does it? It's been too well crafted for me to believe that it's going to leave off abruptly, but I have this lingering suspicion that we will finish with several things unresolved. This is not a mark against the series, um, but up until the 10th episode, I felt like we were structured around a complete tale inside these 13 episodes, um, and I definitely don't believe that anymore. Thus, I suspect we are instead building up to a revelation or two that will be satisfying in their own right, even if some things are still mysterious when the final credits run. Anyway, let's look at how our group has weathered last episode's setback. So as far as goals go, I want to start out by saying that even though a lot of the episode is about Nanachi, I don't have any sense of goals from her. We aren't given any change that she is pursuing. She is taking care of Midi for whatever reason, but that's really more of the setting. She even states that no matter what anyone tries, they, meaning Hollows, can never go back to the way they were. So we can't even assume that she has some goal of saving her, or whatever that might entail. Nanachi may have goals, but nothing in this episode gives me anything that I can point to and say, this is what drives her. Maybe that will change, but there is nothing to add for her right now. Rico's goal of Conquer Abyss gets a bit of a test. Well, actually it got tested last episode, but we needed this one to explain the context for us. Nanachi questions Reg about his decision of where to cut Rico's arm off, and infers that Rico might have been the one to guide him to cut at her forearm rather than at her elbow. Evidently, still having some remnant of her arm past the elbow gives her a lot more options when it comes to cave raiding. I actually wondered this last time before we knew if she'd lose the arm or not, about whether she might be able to compensate for a lost hand with some kind of body modification relic. Something just like that must be what Rico has in mind. Now, this means that conquering the abyss is still so central of a goal to Rico's identity that even in the extreme duress of that moment, she was still unwilling to abandon it. It's one thing to think you'd be capable of suffering a broken bone or amputation in pursuit of your goals. It's quite another to be staring down that prospect and already in pain and still stick to that resolve. I wondered last time if they might need to do some soul searching about this whole quest after the failure with the orb piercer. But if Rico's decision here is any indication, that discussion is over before it has even begun. Lastly, we get a little peek into Reg's unknown goal. This is an unusual goal, honestly, because while having character goals be unknown to the audience is not that uncommon, having a character not know their own goal, and yet know that they did have one, changes how we normally think of tracking narrative progress. This goal doesn't inform his current motives, and therefore doesn't inform his current actions, and yet he knows some chain of events in his past led him to this situation. This is different from a character who just has amnesia. Reg knows he had a purpose, and has come down to the abyss because it is important to him to find out what it is. In a way, this is two goals. Whatever the original goal is, and a goal of figuring out what the original goal is. It's goals all the way down. The insight we get into his original purpose comes from an immersive memory that he stumbles into when he goes out to wash Rico's clothing. Looking at the graves behind Nanachi's hideout initiates a memory of Liza's grave. The dialogue he hears, I'll be going now, Liza, appears to be his own voice. 
Knowing her name and having a visual memory of that spot pretty well confirms something we have guessed at least since episode 4, which is that Liza and Reg knew each other and were fundamentally linked. The nature and degree of that link is still a mystery, though we have had some guesses, but I think we no longer have to wonder if they are connected. Even more concrete, we see him holding a necklace in the memory, and it starts to trigger some other remembrance before Nanachi rouses him. We had guessed way back in episode 1 that this necklace came from Reg. Not only does Rico find it near where he has passed out, they also specifically tell us that the area they are in has mostly been searched already. We know something like that would not be laying out uh, for very long, and we can infer that it just got there. Now, Reg himself starts to wonder if maybe he buried Liza, though he then remembers that Ozen says no one was buried there. This is something else we speculated way back in episode 6, that perhaps Reg buried Liza and or put her notes, whistle, and blaze reap right there, before coming up to the surface, burying the necklace, and presumably looking for Rico. This worked out with the timing of when Liza's stuff was found versus when Reg appeared on the surface. It also potentially explained why the Crimson Split Jaw was on the first level, or why Reg was in position to save Rico at all. Now, all of that could be true even if no one is buried there. It could be more of a memorial, either because Liza's body couldn't be transported to where she would like to have been buried, or because she isn't dead but someone believes she is, or because she needs someone to believe she is. I'll have more thoughts about the whole problem with her stuff making it to the surface uh, later on. The takeaway, I think, is that whatever drove Reg to the surface has something to do with Liza and something to do with that necklace. I'm assuming that Rico is carrying the necklace around with her, um, but I don't think we've even seen it since she first picked it up. I really wonder what will happen if or when Reg sees it again, because I imagine it is directly related to this big unknown that lies across his past. However, that unknown goal of Reg's also shows up in our conflict section. We made Reg's resurfacing memories a conflict some time ago because the content of those memories is a big question mark. X-factors like this, whose outcome is unknown, but that you reasonably assume will impact the story, are things that I like to track as conflicts. Now, while there is no indication that the content of his memories will cause issues just yet, the way in which this memory surfaced suggests a different problem. He enters this memory without any idea that he is in a memory. He even walks and looks around, speaks aloud to himself, and so on, even though in reality he is just standing stock still behind Nanachi's hideout. There is some implication that the similarity between Nanachi's backyard and Liza's gravesite is what prompts him to go full dive into memory lane. As we get deeper into the abyss and the situations more dire, the fact that Reg can be living in a memory without knowing that he's living in a memory seems worrisome. We don't even know why this one was so realistic to him. The strength of the memory itself? Their proximity to the bottom? There's a lot of unknowns here. Maybe it never causes a problem, but Reg retrieving another memory is on the short list of things that I guarantee will happen by the time the series is over. So last time we added Rico's physical state as a conflict, while we don't yet know what the long-term consequences will be, um, if any, it looks like the short-term worries are over. She isn't going to die or lose the arm with things as they are right now. Whether there is some other outcome from the ordeal we don't yet know about, uh, we'll see. Being poisoned and losing blood might still affect her in some way that we don't expect. Lastly, we added a conflict of other white whistles in the past, not only did Ozen specifically warn against the three she thinks are active, there is still that whole issue of them being fugitives, and Reg being a super valuable relic. Now, Ozen specified Bondaruda as a scoundrel, and so last time we talked about how likely it was that they would run into him if no one else. This time, we get to see that Nanachi and the old scoundrel have a history. Nanachi is visibly younger in her brief memory, so we can't say if this is a currently maintained relationship or not. But I said last time that the timing of Nanachi's introduction to the series suggested that she could be antagonistic to our characters, and at the very least will probably not be what she seems to them. A connection to Bondaruda makes this increasingly likely. One last thing here, just like I didn't have a goal for Nanachi, I am not going to add a conflict for Miti. 
Even though we end with her on top of Rico and Reg about to walk in the door and see it, I don't think that this is some new threatening development. Rather, it seems like the setup to some revelation. We're about to discover something new about Rico or about Mitty. Even though Nanachi's description of Hollows suggests that they lose their intelligence and personality, that end shot with Rico reflected in Miti's eyes suggests that Miti understands something about the situation. So I'm expecting that this will be addressed basically immediately next episode, and it won't be as threatening as they have set it up to seem. In characterization, the episode is mostly about Nanachi, so we will do the other two first. Uh, Rico, despite being unconscious for the entire episode, does get a little filling in due to Nanachi figuring out her motivation in directing Reg's attempted amputation. We cover this pretty well in goals already. Um, character goals and characterization often go hand in hand. Only thing to add is that she was holding on to her mother's whistle during the whole amputation scene. I didn't comment on this last time but because I was unsure what to think. We've spoken before about how Rico doesn't really have a concept of her mother beyond the folk hero that everyone else knows. For that reason, I didn't find it likely that there was some emotional comfort that she got out of holding onto it. However, now that we know why she elected to have her arm cut the way she did, I think the grasping of the whistle is less about comfort and more about motivation. Like, if she wants to find her mother and or have a white whistle of her own one day, then she can't abandon being a cave raider. She has to endure the pain of breaking bones and amputation. Gripping the whistle helps remind her why she is enduring it all. Reg this episode really drives home some of the stuff I said last time about being better off when he doesn't have to be the decision maker, at least in a crisis situation. Once he's willing to accept that Nanachi is being helpful, he is enthusiastic and driven and grateful so long as he is doing what she tells him to do. However, there is a difference in how he acts when he is taking his own orders without Rico around. Um, and what I mean is, I pointed out last time that Reg will freeze with indecision when he and Rico get into trouble, and has largely relied on her giving direction because she is mentally cooler under pressure. This time, with Nanachi, when a crisis or threat appears, he actually jumps to conclusions, acting or speaking without trying to recontextualize what might be going on. He does this when he comes back to Nanachi stripping Rico, rushing in as though to separate them. He also immediately jumps to anger when he discovers that Nanachi was watching them interact with the orb piercer, and again when he finds out that he spent the day gathering up her dinner. Basically, with Rico not around, he loses his indecision. He will jump to a conclusion or action, even if hasty and wrong, rather than spend time trying to reason out the right course of action. Isn't that interesting? It's like he knows that even if he chooses wrong, he still has to choose something if Rico isn't around to backstop him. Now, the reason he jumps to these conclusions in the same way each time is that he doesn't quite trust Nanachi. I don't think he considers her suspicious. I just think he is so defensive and scared and overprotective of Rico that he is going to default to assuming the worst. He actually did something similar way back in episode 4 with Habo of all people. Reg simply has a protective instinct that overrides everything else. He doesn't fully trust anyone except himself and Rico, and maybe not even himself. Now, when it comes to Nanachi, he's probably justified in not fully trusting her. I mentioned the connection she has to Bonaruda already, but we don't know if that has any bearing on the current situation just yet. However, we twice get to hear Nanachi's thoughts in the middle of their exchanges, and both times remarking to herself that Reg is a pushover. This is an unusual exception in our series. Most of the time, if we go into a character's thoughts, it is clearly separated from the surrounding scenes. This happens when Leader has finished telling Rico of her origin. It happens when Habo is thinking about the past when he sees Reg and Rico off. It happens a few times when Ozen is by herself and reminiscing about her past with Liza. Even Nanachi having the memory triggered by Liza's whistle matches this pattern. But hearing her thoughts mid-conversation is out of the ordinary. Thus, it is important enough that we know she is manipulating him to alter their normal storytelling technique. So, when we start talking about Nanachi, we have to start by observing that she is probably being deliberate in the type of personality that she presents to Reg. Now, what does she present? Well, she is helpful and confident that she knows what to do. She never takes his suspicion personally. 
In fact, she seems to understand both why he is hesitant and also why he really has no other choice. The only thing that gets an emotional response from her at all is when he gets into her personal space or is being noisy. But she's also kind of a brat. She mocks his distress when he thought that Rico was dying, and she is sarcastic about the wisdom of him doing anything to question her actions or motives. She knows that Rico, at least, is a cave raider, but she feels no restraint about criticizing cave raider actions or knowledge. She may be quite literally a lifesaver, but she shows no sympathy at all for how Reg feels. Now, this is the personality that she is presenting to Reg, but I think at least some of it is a front. The best illustration of this comes from the difference between the last scene of episode 10 and that same scene retold at the beginning of episode 11. They are mostly the same events, with the change that we get to see Nanachi before Reg does. She is listening to his distress over Rico's predicament, and when he says, don't leave me behind, Rico, it causes Nanachi to have a brief flashback to a red-haired, red-eyed girl who grins at her. After this flashback, Nanachi gets up and goes to help them. I think we can assume that the reason Nanachi helps them is a sense of empathy. She knows what Reg is feeling, and so takes action. She will later tell Reg that she never had any intention of revealing herself. When pressed about why she did, she will spin it as Reg sounding so pitiful, sobbing like a lost kid. She mocks Reg rather than admit that she felt any empathy. However, when she imitates him, saying, Rico don't leave me, this appears to be what triggers Miti in the other room to start to vocalize. Now, this might be coincidence, but Reg's cries about not being left behind connect directly to the redhead in Nanachi's mind and her own mocking of that cry appears to prompt Miti to speak up. Now, I am assuming that Miti is the little girl in the memories, uh, since they both have red eyes. Considering these two reactions, it seems reasonable to assume that there was a don't leave me moment between Miti and Nanachi sometime in the past. Once we learn what usually happens to Hollows, this seems even more likely. So I feel pretty confident in believing that Nanachi understood Rico and Reg's situation on a personal level, which is the real reason she intervened. But she is unwilling to show this connection and emotional capacity to Reg, and that is the real takeaway here. She is keeping him at arm's length. Why? Now, I can understand being in no particular hurry to make new friends in the Abyss. One doesn't need extra vulnerabilities. However, she took them into her home. She made Miti's presence and existence known, even though she obviously cares about Miti's well-being. Like, I don't think all the stuffed animals in that room are just there by accident. She reveals that the curse isn't present there. She reveals that there is a back entrance. She literally reveals where the bodies are buried. She introduces Reg to so many vulnerable details of her existence, and yet wants to keep a strict emotional distance. That sounds a lot like how you treat someone you don't think will be around for very long. You aren't worried about the knowledge they have about you now, but you also don't want any pain for yourself by getting attached. I'm not saying that this means that Nanachi is treacherous. She might be, but it's not the only option. However, I think a certain complicated relationship with cave raiders is implied here, but that is probably best talked about in world building, so let's move on to that. One of the key pieces of world building we learned this time was about hollows, where they come from and the usual way they are handled. We had guessed last time that it might be related to ascending from the sixth layer, that this was the loss of humanity referred to. Like I said though, I did not expect Miti and her situation, especially learning that she is the rule and Nanachi is the exception. Evidently, ascending from the sixth layer means either you die or you end up like that. It should be no surprise that even white whistles usually only go to the fifth layer. Now, Nanachi doesn't say this outright, but I get the feeling this is where her antagonism comes from. Though she gives the explanation of cave raiders killing hollows in order to explain why she hides, I imagine it informs her opinion of cave raiders in general. The fact that she herself hasn't put Miti to death implies that she disagrees with their normal procedure. I'll have a lot to wonder about this in our last two sections, uh, so we'll come back to it. The one thing I want to point out now, though, is her information about cave raiders telling everyone that Hollows died. I understand the rationale here, the why of putting Hollows down. Rather, it's the lie about their fate that interests me. 
Suddenly, we need to question every instance of death that we've heard about thus far, and that has some interesting implications. Uh, we will come back to that as it led to my very long final speculation for this video. Now to run through some other world building details, uh, Nanachi was the presence that Reg detected early on last episode. Um, I wondered if that would get answered. It did, and what's more, it helps characterize Nanachi. To know that she was aware of them the whole time and didn't reveal herself until she had that moment of empathy uh, tells us a lot about her. Relatedly, Nanachi says to Reg that it's the first time anyone like you two has come here. We don't get any more information on what makes them exceptional, but what it might mean at the very least is that there aren't a lot of kids wandering around down here, like ever. Their age might have gotten her interest in the same way that it got Maruk's interest back at the Seeker camp. But it would appear that Nanachi doesn't live in complete isolation. She makes a comment about the suppository that she uses on Rico that she got it from a friend. Well, what friend? She says she can't reveal herself to cave raiders because she puts the lie to their assumptions about hollows, and then she also says that no one like Reg and Rico has come here before. So who could this medicine-wielding friend be? Perhaps our clue is in the next bit of world building, which is that Nanachi recognizes Liza's whistle. Now, we don't know whether she recognizes it as Liza's or simply knows that it's a white whistle. It could simply be the latter, which is why it immediately prompts her flashback to Bondaruda. But either way, it tells us that either Nanachi knows Liza or she knows about white whistles beyond just whatever relationship she's had with Bondaruda. And some aspect of these white whistle relationships is probably still ongoing. She gets the medicine from somewhere and white whistles seem like the only possibility based on what we know right now. But the main thing is, she and Bondaruda know each other, or at least used to. There's a lot of things in her memory of him that we don't have context for. There's a mention of a cartridge, whatever that means, um, Nanachi being contributory to it in some way, Nanachi looking the same despite being much younger, there's some kind of experiment that was successful, and yet whatever it involved seems to make Nanachi rather subdued. And then just the room they are in, metal and pipes and normal electrical lights, uh, completely different from anything we've seen in the abyss. So either up above or further below? Is Nanachi an escapee from some experimental center somewhere? The very idea that there are possibly secret experiments going on somewhere has far reaching implications, especially if they are happening below us. Potentially speaking of this, I didn't mention this last time, but when Nanachi is walking Reg through blowing a breath into Rico, and he does so, she actually seems surprised or interested. We find out that she watched him do the extendo arms thing, so she already knew he was a robot or a mechanical doll. Is she surprised that he can breathe? Remember, Ozen made a comment about how he blinks and breathes despite being a mechanical doll. I feel like there is some significance here, especially as they include her reaction in both last episode and this one, even though the scenes are not carbon copies of one another. So there are a variety of creatures we encounter during Reg's shopping trip. Um, no need to cover them all. We've gotten new creature or plant lore almost every episode of the series. Uh, it's one of the many ways the creator have constructed a really robust and complex setting for the story. The only creature situation that's notable is the shroom bears and their parasitic water shrooms. Combining this water shroom treatment with Nanachi's comments about cave raiders not knowing how to deal with injuries, and we can infer that Nanachi possesses a type of survival craft that does not come from cave raider knowledge, but instead from a life lived inside the abyss. Whether she figured this stuff out herself, or there is some other abyssal residence that she can learn from is something we'll just have to wait on. But this fix coming from outside the Cave Raider knowledge base is worth noting. Um, it's unexplained for now, but there are the graves outside Nanachi's little hovel. There are more of them than there are whistles in her house, so I am not sure there is a relation there. Um, I expect we will learn more about this next time. What is worth noting is that eternal fortunes grow here just as they do around Liza's grave. The similarity might be just what prompted Rig's memory. Does that mean that these flowers are especially common where things are buried? Or is this just a symbolic linking meant for the audience rather than some sort of in-universe logic? Uh, we would just have to wait and see on this as well. 
In theme today, we have more from our dominance gravity of the unknown, specifically the subcategory I called in search of a past. This is really a combination of things I talked about concerning Reg already, both his unknown goal and the goal to make it less unknown, if that makes sense, um, and the immersive memory he experiences right at the end of the episode. The various crises they've endured in the last few episodes had pushed his quest for his origin to the side a bit, but the surprise of the memory has brought both Reg and us back to wondering about his past. Considering where we are in the series, I suspect this return to focus means Reg's history will end up having a lot of thematic weight to it. Uh, more on this in speculation. In the ends versus means category, Rico checks off the boxes of the cost of progress and this idea of being worthy of the abyss by willing to endure the mid-forearm amputation so that she doesn't have to give up cave raiding. If cave raiders were some kind of gang or club, I feel like this action of hers should qualify as a successful initiation. You know, over and over in the series, we hear about the sacrifices and the accumulation of knowledge that has contributed to what they know about the abyss to this point. Like, the understanding that they have, limited as it is, has been hard won. Ozen's monologue about how people down there don't really believe in God, but do believe in the abyss, paints this picture of the entire cave raiding population as a kind of subculture to me. The sense I get of cave raider traditions reminds me of skater culture, or punk rock, or the main characters of a cyberpunk. Some kind of group characterized as outsiders and in conflict with traditional authority, that also share an aesthetic or worldview. This has some crossover with the Gravity of the Unknown theme, as the shared tenets of the Cave Raider identity seem to be a nearly pathological fascination with the unknown, and an acceptance of the inevitability of dealing out or receiving death. As I think back, I feel like most of our main players fit comfortably into this idea. In a way, Cave Raider culture is a bunch of crazy people who accept an overwhelming risk of pain and sacrifice just to push further into the abyss. There's like a minimum level of crazy needed to consider it, and probably a maximum level of self-preservation instinct as well. So I want to connect that idea to our next theme, which is closest to that whole strength from the sacrifice of precursors, which is a mouthful. Anyway. For this, I want us to look at the opening narration for this episode, which is spoken over the replayed scene from last time. I'm just going to put the whole quote over here, where you can refer to it. Um, now we talked about this before, progress being built on the efforts and hardships and deaths of others. Here we get a visualization of this in our narration, likening the decaying matter which feeds plants to the sacrifices necessary for beauty, or progress or advancement, what have you. We've observed already that the eternal fortune flowers are in large supply at these two different grave sites, which reinforces the symbolism. This also reminds me strongly of Shigi's discussion of the veracity of information that comes from the abyss. He says that even if a white whistle loses his life, he lives on as a voice of the abyss and guides everyone. However, this narration takes particular note of the anonymity of the innumerable deaths, saying that unless you are one of those directly concerned, this is not something you can know. You can understand intellectually that a lot of pain and death has gone into progress, both in the abyss and in wider civilization, but unless you personally experience some of that, the entire idea of sacrifice remains abstract. Having this narration play over Nanachi considering whether or not to reveal herself really ties the idea into the present in a concrete way. Hearing Reg in pain is one thing, but because she imagines a personal example of loss in her own mind at the same time, his pain is not an abstraction to her. It becomes relatable, she feels an empathetic connection, and so comes forth to aid them. At the same time, Reg is now getting his own personal experience with tragedy. Rico seems like she will live, but in this moment, Reg doesn't know that. He is becoming one of those directly concerned. And yet, there is the second part of the narration. After highlighting the anonymity of all the tragic stories that make up the history of the Abyss, it instead emphasizes the loveliness of the place. The narration is not demanding a price for admission. Rather, it says that you should simply be captivated by the utterly dazzling beauty and push on. The cost of this beauty is tragedy, 
but that doesn't mean it is a cost everyone must pay. There may ultimately be more that is beautiful than there is that is tragic. Certainly, all of those citizens up in Orth do not risk what the cave raiders risk, and yet it seems they are all beneficiaries of their efforts. However, the Abyss is home to wondrous sights and unbelievable vistas. Never leaving Orth means no risk of suffering below, but it also means that such beauty will only ever be rumor. As we approach the end of the series, we get a more complete picture of all the things the Abyss as symbol may represent. This bit of narration in particular strikes me as being key to our understanding once we are able to look back at the whole thing. So in What to Watch For, we've gotten a lot of new mysteries this time around, and they mostly concern Nanachi and Miti and Hollows. Nanachi has given us one version of the situation, but I honestly have to wonder. For example, when Reg asks about why Nanachi didn't turn out like Miti, she says that there is a reason that she is an exception among exceptions. Okay, what reason is that? I mean, when Nanachi was explaining the normal hollow process and how cave raiders deal with it, it seemed like she was implying that she went through something similar. That could certainly explain why she has all of those whistles and other equipment, that she was part of some expedition that returned from the sixth lair, and she was the only one who retained her mind. It could even explain all the graves out back. And this is what I would have guessed happened, except for her flashback. She is younger, maybe much younger, during her memory with Bondaruda, and yet she already looks the way she looks. So, are we to believe that a child that young was somehow part of a cave raiding expedition that went lower than even White Whistles go? Outside of some kind of illegal raid or foreign expedition or something, I am really skeptical of this implied origin. So we will have to watch for other pieces of how Nanachi came to be. Like, is she even a hollow? Did she come from somewhere besides Orth? That of course means we also need to watch for how Miti got into this situation. The girl in Nanachi's memory is quite young as well, and so all the same questions apply. In what scenario would someone that age be down below the sixth level? It's possible that all those graves and all that equipment comes from a raid that contained Miti, and she is the lone survivor, though in the state we see her. But still, how did that situation present itself? I guessed long ago about the possibility of some kind of people or extant civilization that existed at the bottom of the abyss, that the curse seemed like the kind of thing that could both keep those residents in and keep outsiders out not to mention preventing the escape of knowledge from below. Having what seem like two instances of children being below the sixth level starts to make this seem even more feasible to me. So I want to watch for any other clues about a settlement or a facility or something that could produce children and yet exists far enough down to be outside of common knowledge. Also, where are Rico's glasses? They disappeared somewhere between the beginning of their ascent away from the orb piercer last time and the point where Reg laid her out to attend to her injury. I have some lingering speculations about her eyes, right? But the glasses are absent this whole episode. Are they lost somewhere? Maybe I'm fixated on trivialities here, but she somehow held on to those things through all of the trials so far. Their absence doesn't seem like oversight. So I'm looking for them or her different eyesight to come back into the story. And lastly, something I haven't really been watching for all this time is the unheard bell. It's literally a relic that can stop time, whatever that means, and is also both the expedition that claimed Torka and birthed Rico. It was a seminal moment in Liza and Rico's life, and maybe even Ozen's, and yet we've never heard another thing about the relic itself or where it ended up. I don't necessarily expect this to re-enter the series like I do with Rico's eyesight, but something like stopping time is potentially a powerful story-changing ability. Wouldn't they have chosen something more innocuous if the power itself was never going to matter? We'll keep an eye out. So that just leaves speculation. I have a long and ponderous one, so I will make it last. Um, I do want to say that I have no idea what to speculate about Miti. I was not expecting uh, such a character introduction. As I was just saying and what to watch for, there's a lot about the situation that I am skeptical of, so there is nothing I can guess that wouldn't just be a pure shot in the dark. 
Only thing I'm curious about is whether there is some link between Miti and the only other person we've seen with red hair, which is Laffy. There was that one moment when she seemed pensive about Habo's desire to become a white whistle back when she and Rico were chatting in episode two. She and Habo are also very friendly to the children and yet seem to have none of their own. Does some shadow lie across their past? Maybe nothing to it. Uh, like I said, I'm just kind of guessing in the dark here. Um, with the way we've left off, um, I am sure we will at least rapidly learn something more clarifying next time. So I guess technically I have already speculated that Miti scaling onto Rico is not a conflict or cause for concern, but I got nothing beyond that. Next, I want to add on to something I've speculated about before, which is the nature of the Curse of the Abyss. The description that we got for the sixth layer curse this time kind of bothers me from a logistical standpoint. Apparently, ascending from the sixth layer means you either die or you become a hollow, and hollows always lose their intelligence and personality. So, how would anyone know? If you're there to watch someone ascend, then it means you're either going to die or become a hollow yourself, right? Ozen even warns them about the fifth layer probably having white whistles in it because it's as deep as humans can go and return alive. So how is there any information about the sixth layer? Why would anyone even try to ascend and have the opportunity to become a hollow in the first place if it's either that or death? In episode three, they even point out that going to the sixth layer and beyond is referred to as a last dive because they can't return. So. In what circumstance are people trying to come up for the sixth layer, becoming hollows, and having others around to put them out of their misery? It's something we talked about last time, but does this imply that the curse is avoidable? We already know it can be weaker in places, or even not present, as Nanachi indicates. I figure you can't have flying creatures at all unless they know how to avoid it or are simply immune to it. So I'm going to guess that some way to detect and avoid the curse exists, and that this might be why we have an understanding about the sixth layer effects, or people like Nanachi, or why children that young were down there in the first place, and so on. At the very least, there is something about it we don't understand. In fact, this whole sixth layer barrier brings up an additional question about Liza's notes, as she had details from the seventh layer in there. Something got those notes up and past the sixth layer while still having the wherewithal to deposit them in that field of eternal fortunes. Now, the easy answer to the problem of Liza's notes is what we've implied already, that Reg, who we know is immune, did the honors of leaving all of that stuff there. He simply doesn't remember. But how and why such a scenario would come up is still a mystery, and answering that mystery forms my final speculation. So I have a pair of warnings before I go into this last idea for two different sets of viewers. I imagine most of you have already seen the whole series and know where it is going. You might not care to watch me try to pull a lot of disparate threads together for this one, since I could easily be wrong, and it's also kind of long-winded. But though this channel is about anime analysis, a secondary purpose is exploring storytelling concepts and discussion in general. I try to give some rationale for why I speculate this or that, and so even if I'm wrong, I hope there is some value in detailing the thought process that leads me to these ends. If you're still on board for that, let's keep going. Otherwise, the video has probably run out of worth for you. The second warning is to the other set of viewers, those who are like me and don't know any further into the story. What I'm about to speculate is the kind of thing that would make sense as a final reveal, a satisfying bit of resolution for a story that I increasingly believe will not fully wrap up. I could easily be wrong about this, um, there's a lot of unknowns and moving parts, but if I'm right, this would be a pretty major spoiler. So you might want to skip it and come back at the end of the series to see if I was anywhere close. All right, with that said, I'm going to trace for you exactly how I ended up with this particular speculation. I mentioned already that Nanachi's explanation about cave raiders killing hollows, but then telling everyone they died, meant that we needed to question every death we'd heard about in the series. So I went looking backward. There are a lot of implied deaths for sure. The parents of all the children in the orphanage, 
all of the members of the Unheard Bell expedition, except for Ozen and Liza, the vast amount of cave raiders who disappear into the depths, or clash with foreign cave raiders, and so on. But they are mostly nameless and faceless. This, even though we learn the names of people we may never encounter, such as the other white whistles that might be below us. There is one exception. There is one person who is said to have died whose name we learn. That was the first hint, and we will come back to it. The next part only occurred to me because of the huge gap between making the video for episode 9 and the one for episode 10. Because of that gap, I wanted to re-familiarize myself with everything I had already discussed, and so I watched all of my previous videos. They were fresh on my mind, basically, when they wouldn't have been otherwise. What got my attention was when I talked about the ending credits back in, I think, the fourth episode's video. I had previously analyzed the opening credits in the second video, and I fixed on one image in particular from those credits, the painterly shot of Liza. Everything else in the opening is standard animation, so I said that this rendering of her probably illustrated the idealized fantasy version of Liza that existed in Rico's head. Rico doesn't have a real image of her mother, just the folk hero image. This has been supported by other moments with Liza since then. She exists as illustrations when Leader is telling the story to Rico, and even when Rico is imagining her, her eyes are never shown. She's still incomplete. The only time this ever changes is when we are seeing Ozen's memory, because Ozen did have a complete picture of Liza, so her image of her is not hazy or stylized or fantastical. So, when we got to the ending credits, and almost the whole thing is stylized, I talked about how it seemed less like an accurate representation of their journey and more like a storybook version. It's a sanitized and lighter rendering of the actual trip down. Then, since we had the lyrics translated for us, we looked these over as well. I said that a lot of the lyrics sounded like they could be about Reg and Rico embarking on a type of fairy tale adventure to match the illustration like animation, and that the we in that song could be the two of them. But, I also pointed out that some of the lyrics sounded more like a parent reading to a child, especially moments when it talks about always being beside you, the past, present, and future. At the time, I only thought in terms of Liza, like this could be read as Reg and Rico discussing their ongoing journey, or it could be Liza speaking to Rico, which especially made sense to me as I had been assuming that Liza is the one that is performing our narrator duties. But, Rather than either a reg rico relationship being the we, or a parent-child relationship being the we, what if it's not or, but and? Reg and Rico, and a parent-child. See, the one person who we are told died that also has a name is Torka, Rico's father. He is the person whose death I now have cause to doubt. Before this episode, there was no reason to suspect any other fate. Certainly all of the people in Rico's life that care about her wouldn't be deceiving her. This is especially true for people like Habo and Leader. Whether he died from foreign cave raiders or some other method, the end result is that he's dead. That is the only truth that matters for Rico, right? Unless it wasn't true. When I look back at the two times that Torka's death are mentioned, no cause is given. Ozen only refers to him quickly passing away, and Leader says that he lost his life. Because Leader's story also concerns the run-ins with foreign cave raiders, we naturally make the assumption that this is what kills Torka. But what if it's somewhat worse than that? Here is where World of Children really earns its keep, because we only have the kid's point of view to go on, and of course, there are all kinds of truths that you hide from kids because, well, they're just kids. So let's question our story a little bit. Let's be more skeptical than the kids would be. The unheard bell that their expedition was sent to retrieve was on the fourth layer, right? But somehow that expedition took 10 months, despite them apparently already knowing the thing was down there. Considering Reg and Rico's pace, doesn't that seem way too long for a team full of black and white whistles? So what if instead, our new information about hollows and what usually happens to them is the real truth? Something caused their expedition to end up in the sixth lair, or Torka at the very least, and the attempt to ascend left him a hollow. So the next step for their party would be to kill him, strip his gear, and tell everyone that he died, right? But what if they didn't? 
And how would such a thing come about? Well, I don't have any reason to suspect this about Liza's character, one way or the other. Um, this is definitely very speculative because I'm just trying to connect the dots. But since Torka was her husband and the father of her unborn child, what if Liza insisted on being the one to put him out of his misery? Like an of mice and men or an old yeller type of situation. She takes him somewhere private to have a moment alone, is going to do her duty of extinguishing him, and just doesn't. But she tells everyone that she does. Then everyone would simply repeat the story that he died and not question it any further. And yet, that leaves some version of Torka alive and alone in the abyss with only Liza knowing the truth. Maybe in a normal situation this plays out differently, but Ozen's memory implies that Liza would have been heavily pregnant at the point when Torka died. There was not going to be any kind of rescue or exception for Torka in this scenario. I mean, maybe he even got into such a situation because of needing to fill in for Liza, or protect his very pregnant wife, or something. I suddenly wonder if our unheard Bell might have any input on the matter. Anyway, due to Rico's birth, Liza and her and Ozen return to the surface, leaving Hollow Torka behind. But at some point, of course, Liza wants to go try and find him, even if it means it's her last dive. Maybe she even has some reason to believe he could be alive, or even could be saved. Heck, maybe the message inside Liza's notebook wasn't from her to Rico, but from Torka to Liza. But how? And in what state? Certainly something like Miti doesn't seem like it could survive on its own, let alone write a message. So then, this is what I speculate. The only thing that makes sense to me considering everything I just talked about. Reg is really Torka. Now, I have no idea how this transformation could have come about, though I have wondered about some kind of remnant of civilization still living down below, and now we also have the mystery of Bondaruda and vague experiments. But however it happened, Torka is rescued from his death and encased inside Reg's artifact body, without anyone even knowing that it has happened, at least until Liza runs into him again. This would really tie up a ton of loose ends. Searching for him could begin to explain what happened to Liza. Being at the seventh level or lower means she's effectively trapped there forever. Maybe she really has died, but in either case, Torka Breg comes to the surface in search of his daughter, someone he presumably wouldn't have known existed before. He brings Liza's things to that place in the field of flowers, like we've said. Maybe he even runs into Ozen and reveals the truth, which is why she is so pleased that he has lost his memory when they meet again. It might even be why she enjoyed beating the crap out of him so much. He then brought the necklace up, whose purpose we don't yet know. And somewhere between shooting at the split jaw and waking up in the orphanage, he loses his memory. I now kind of wonder if it was Rico shocking him that actually scrambled his mind, rather than the passing out after firing incinerator. Or maybe even just being separated from the necklace. It would explain a lot about his behavior as well. He doesn't think of himself as a robot, and as we've pointed out, he often acts more like a human than Rico does. No one has seen or heard of anything like him existing, so there would have been no suspicion that such a thing could have come about until Liza literally lays eyes on him. And in her notes, something just like Reg was supposedly following her and watching her. Anyway, after thinking about all this, I was curious to see if they had intentionally avoided drawing attention to Torka, so I went back through. He shows up three times, and in every case, there is something else to draw our attention. Initially, we learn about him during Leader telling Rico the story of her birth, which of course is way more immediate and interesting to us in that moment. The second time he shows up is during some of Ozen's flashbacks, and is the only time we get to see him. Gee, he sure is small. But that moment gets turned into humor, as Ozen's shocked face accompanies Liza's sudden marriage announcement. It's just used as a joke. Finally, he is mentioned in passing right when Ozen is reliving the day of Rico's birth, in the moments between the stillbirth and her realizing that Rico has come back to life inside the vessel. Like in the first instance, the larger story of that moment is what catches our attention. The mention of Torka is just an aside, a minor detail. So that means they planted him enough times for us to remember him, but painstakingly avoided drawing too much direct attention. Just dropping him into casual conversation apropos of nothing might have made us suspicious, 
but in this manner, they have disguised him as just part of the setting detail, much like the constant introduction of new flora and fauna. Honestly, it is the subtle way he's been introduced and those ending song lyrics that make me want to believe that this is where we are headed. It would certainly explain why we have this whole bit with Nanachi and Miti and the Truth of Hollows at this very pivotal moment in the story structure. And heck, Rico suddenly gaining a parent and Torka gaining a daughter is just the kind of revelation that could give us a satisfying finale without completing the whole tale. So then, that is that. I'm sorry that was long, and I'm especially sorry if I'm way off. There are still some question marks in there, but it would certainly erase a lot of the ones I have about the story right now. Even though I don't think I'll get all of the answers in episode 12, I'm going to go watch it right now, because I found the episode 11 cliffhanger way worse than the episode 10 one. Uh, we will chat about that episode when I return from my vacation, so I will see you then.